It's always dangerous at a conference like this. You feel like you end up patronising people if you show them bits of maths because a lot of people have seen it before. But also, you don't want to tell people what to do. So I've tried to find some sort of middle ground between just patronising the hell out of you uh, and showing you some cool stuff. And I chose the title Moving Maths for two reasons. One is that there's an emotional component to mathematics which I think we neglect at our peril. And that's actually been turning up a lot yesterday. There's a lot of talking about hearts on as well as minds on and all that stuff. So I want to talk about emotions and how mathematics might move you. Um, but I also want to talk about the way that actually seeing maths move in a sort of physical or visual way changes the way that you think about it. And I think these are both things I've learned from doing uh, outreach talks. Um, and just to introduce myself, I do work for the University of Bath and the Further Maths Support Programme and as a freelancer doing maths outreach stuff based in Bath. So uh, there's a few things to address. Th these are the two themes I'm going to just touch on. But let's do the mathematicians bit first. This is a genuinely a quote I heard from a student in not my class, but in a school I worked in. They were talking about different subjects and they said, maths, where emotions go to die. <laughs> <laughs> and I, well, I think we ignore this comment at our, at our peril because it's a genuine opinion that some people have about maths. Now, I suspect, I'm preaching to the converted slightly, is that you know this is not true. That in jobs as mathematicians and as maths teachers and as anything to do with maths, you have an emotional reaction to a lot of stuff. But unfortunately, the stereotype exists that all mathematicians are like this guy, right? <laughs> this guy has apparently no... Uh, wait. My hero. <laughs> oh, sorry, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> well, th there's, this is so well known that mathematicians have no emotions, like Dr. Spock. Um, uh, th there's a meme. The many emotions... I should say Mr. Spock. I think I wrote it correctly. <laughs> Actually, I didn't write. This is a meme going around the internet, um, like many non-funny memes on the internet. <laughs> anyway, this is, this is Spock being happy, apparently. This is, the, uh, this is Spock being lonely. Um, <laughs> you get the uh, joke, right? The, the joke doesn't get any better because it just is the whole of... The, the, range, of math, the, the range of emotions of a mathematician are apparently the same <laughs> as Mr. Spock. <laughs> wow. I don't have laughing manically in there, but anyway. <laughs> I think we need to address this, and um, what I'd like to do, uh, mathematicians are not emotionless, cold, heartless beings, despite the stereotype, um, and as mass communicators, we're in a unique position to, to redress that stereotype, to, to kind of put the balance the other way. As mass teachers, a lot of people are have sort of slaves to, you've got to accomplish a task, which is an exam thing, and many good mass teachers don't just do that, but as mass communicators, we have a bit more freedom to stop this becoming what people expect from mathematicians. So I'd like... Uh, you to talk to the person next to you for 10 seconds and just say the first emotive or feeling words that are associated when you think about doing maths, what are the emotions that come to mind? You've got 10 seconds, go talk. <laughs> what did he say? <laughs> okay, long enough. You clearly haven't got that many emotions. You can't be talking about emotions anymore. Um, I've asked this question to quite a lot of different audiences, including <laughs> students. Um, and actually, these are just the first three words I heard from the front. We had, uh, this, is it Hugh? No, uh, Hamish. Hamish, thinking about elegance. Um, over here we had awe, uh, and Michael then contributed awe of other people who can do it, whereas I can't. I'm, well, I'm sure he was, anyway, I definitely feel that. And is it James? James, yeah. James said fun straighting, which I think can perfectly captures the idea that we do it because it's fun sometimes, but most of the time we feel pretty frustrated because <laughs> it's hard. And actually, so if I had more time, it would be nice to collect a few more ideas, but the... Uh, I, I sort of sampled a whole bunch of stuff and I've come up with this diagram. Frustration turns up really often when you ask someone about their emotions with mathematics. But that's connected to being bored and they're frustrated and that stops you sort of carrying on because you get bored of being frustrated um, and confusion comes out of that as well. And so these are kind of negative reactions. There's also a genuine reaction of fear um, and I would be very surprised if no one mentioned that in the room. But if you ask a, a room of non-mathematicians about their emotions, they, they are scared. Um, and terror sometimes follows <laughs> from fear. But the idea that tension is in mathematics, even for people who are good at it, is, is a very true thing. This is something we kind of forget, and it leads to other things like the feeling of suspense, what's going to happen next, and then the surprise, which is a massive... We talked about this yesterday. You can utilise surprise to get a hook in people. But it's coming from this sort of this slight discomfort. And so the emotions that are negative also kind of lead to positive ones. Um, and humour can come from surprise as well. And these are all things which... I think this is not an obvious one from maths. I mean, all maths jokes are, by definition, rubbish, but... <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> but the idea that we can make humour in math makes it a little bit more human. So we've got surprise and wonder, and all these things have been said by people I've asked. Um, the curiosity and surprise go together, and this feeling, <laughs> get me a pen and paper, is a really common thing about people who know about maths, and they see something which surprises them, and then they want to go and scribble about it. 
the sort of thing that if you go to, ever go to a maths jam sort of thing, that, that sort of thing gets celebrated a lot, um, along with all this stuff as well. So moving, I think as mass communicators, we need to pay attention to emotional stuff. But also one way of doing it, which is the second theme in this, is that if you make stuff move, um, you have a different tool at your disposal. And I think this is a new thing in mathematics. Within the last 25 years, we've got a new tool, which I think we should utilise to get some of this. Am I, so the end of the first half here is, as communicators, I really do think we should choose what emotions to provoke. And add your own emotions to this sort of list. But if we don't choose, you end up getting the default emotions, which are quite often the ones at the top. And if you choose to aim for some suspense leading to some surprise, you have a much better chance of provoking the, the nicer things at the bottom. And I think that's just our job, whether whatever we're doing with maths, if we're going to talk to other people about that, be aware of the human side of it, not the Mr. Spock side of uh, cold, emotionless bastards. Anyway. Um, but the idea that we can make stuff move in another sense is one way of triggering that sort of surprise. So I'm a massive fan of GeoGebra, and Michael was talking about it yesterday, and there are other ways to make maths move, um, and I'm not paid by GeoGebra, just get the sales pitch out of the way. But I want to show you two moving mathematical moments which changed the way I saw a bit of maths. And if you've seen it before, I make no apology because I still think this is worth seeing again. So someone shout out a number, any number? 27. 27. I'm going to ask you to square it. You may wish to reconsider. <laughs> 720, okay, what, if, if you pick a small number. Three, Three Five, square it. Nine, square it. I know it's, uh, it's early, isn't it? The point is, if I keep saying square it, it's going to get bigger. At least that's what everyone says at first. But then they pick one. And you square one, you get one. Anyway, numbers do this. They follow the arrows. When you keep squaring them, they go that way. Not a surprise, unless you go below one, in which case you do know, of course, they go that way. But the other difference is that these are unstable. They don't come back, and these are stable they go towards zero and they stay there. And seeing it move just gives you another sort of appreciation of it. The movement is important here. And if you go past minus one, it flicks again. Unstable, stable, stable, unstable, stable, unstable. You get the idea. And luckily, you know, also know, uh, to cut a long story short, that we don't have just one dimension to work with. And if you know where I'm going with this, you'll have a clue at the punchline. This is a number, complex number. That's its square. has a lovely circular flavor, which you only really see when it moves. And if you keep squaring it, it does this which is nice, but it's definitely stable until you go there and it's unstable, stable, unstable, stable, 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 <laughs> unstable. And if instead of just going square it, square it, square it, you say square it, add something, square it, add something, square it, add something, you get this. So that's, that's pretty, it's moving, but it's, it's, oh, it's stable, stable outside the circle, but here it's stable, unstable. Seeing it move has a magical effect on you generalizing, which is at the heart of maths, but because you can make it move, it's just not a fixed point like it was on paper, you get a free generalizing effect. Uh, so the question is, what's the boundary of this now? It's obviously not a circle, um, and you may know where this is going. If you don't add a constant, you do get a circle. If you add a constant, the boundaries between stable and unstable are these <coughs> shapes. Which is pretty. Hooray for emotional content in mathematics. <laughs> um, these are Julia sets, and if you've never seen them before, go and study them. But it gets better. The final punchline is if you leave this in the middle, you always start at zero, and you you change the constant that you square, and moving this around is just beautiful. It's just really, really lovely. But sometimes it's not. <laughs> and sometimes it's not sure what the hell's going on. And so the punchline is that in 1980, relatively recently, Mr. Mandelbrot, you know where this is going now, decided to colour in the screen. He didn't do it with a brass rubbing like I'm doing here. <laughs> Have you ever tried to explain what a brass rubbing is to students these days? <laughs> you go into a graveyard, it, you what? <laughs> anyway, I'm doing a brass rubbing. Black is stable, blue is unstable, and you just see what picture you get um, if you always just change the constant. And it's not obvious what you're going to get, um, and particularly when it takes as long as this when I'm just doing tiny dots. But you can see that it's not symmetrical. It is symmetrical up and down. You get the blues and the blacks, but it goes further off to the left than you expect. And to cut a long story short, if you keep going, you'd get this picture. And if you didn't know that, is where the Mandelbrot set comes from. This is the Mandelbrot set and is worthy of an exploration. But seeing it arrive in movement, I think, changes the way that you understand it. So my plea is that if we're going to talk, engage emotions in mathematics, then we should use movement to do it. I'm going to show you one other example of a moving bit of maths. Um, I should have warned you at the beginning, I'm also a musician. I am going to force a song on you in a moment, because there's another obvious way uh, where emotions are manipulated uh, in a performance way. You, Music. And music is never done because it's nice. Uh, th sorry, rather. <laughs> never done because it's useful. Yeah. Unless, my joke is, unless I'm really starving and need to go busking. But music is always done because it's nice. And a lot of students forget that maths was mostly done for thousands of years because it's nice or because it's curious or because it's interesting or surprising. 
It was almost never done because it was useful first. It becomes useful after we've done it because it's nice. So here's something which is nice, um, and I'll play some music which goes with it. Imagine you're a flower and you're growing some seeds. I'm going to anthropomorphize this flower. He's growing some seeds out this way. Uh, but if you um, grow some seeds all in a straight line, they get pushed out in a line like that, which is obviously a really bad idea for a flower because you'll fall apart. You may well know that where this is going, but the movement is going to come in a moment. If you grow a seed and you turn half a turn and you grow a seed and you turn half a turn and you grow a seed, you'll grow two lines of seeds like this. Is that okay so far? Not if you're happy with that. If you turn a quarter of a turn each time, what will you see? Just hold it in your head, so you will see that. If you turn uh, three-fifths of a turn each time, you do indeed see five. Um, so it looks like it's the denominator that's controlling things. So if I do 11 over 23, how many spokes will you see? You do indeed see 23, but you also see like a two in the middle, like a, a curvy, th because this is quite close to one over two. So you get a double effect. What's interesting is that it's the denominator that seems to control this, so we just need to check that. So let's do uh, uh, three tenths, ten, good, okay, so let's, let's do six tenths. Oh, right, yeah, because six tenths is three-fifths, and flowers can cancel fractions, yeah? Okay, good. Or there's something profound about fractions, and they should be expressed in the simplest terms, not because it's a good idea for an exam, but it's because it's better describing this. This is something to do with fives, not tens. But the, the thing that makes this interesting is that there are lots of other fractions to choose to turn. In fact, if I change this number very, very slowly, the movement becomes quite hypnotic. And you see that some flower fractions of a turn are better than others. Um, this is great if you just need a conference to go to sleep for an hour. And <laughs> I can just say anything you like now. But the point is, there is one that's going to be better than all the others. Is there one fraction of a turn that gives you... I mean, this is pretty good packing now. So um, it turns out that if you have any rational number you will get spokes. Um, we've seen a few of these. If you have one over pi, you, you still get spokes. In fact, you get 22 of them. And inside, you get three of them. You're seeing rational approximations to pi and a flower. This is amazing. But it also tells you that pi is not very irrational. <laughs> which means there is a more irrational number, and there must be a most irrational number. In fact, to cut to the chase, this is it. And it's, it's visually, obviously, a very good, a very irrational number, because there's no sign of spokes. Every time you see spirals, they go in both directions. And I know flowers use it because I've seen them. It's almost scary, right? But, and no other number works. Actually, that's not quite true. I'll let you go and figure out. What I like about this, though, is just to finish off, is that this... Oh, I want to keep the bit that's moving, because that was kind of the point here. Um, this is beautiful in its own right, even without the flowery background, the fact that maths is making pretty patterns is just something, something sometimes worth celebrating. And it does remind me of a song which I'm going to inflict upon you now, just to make my point, is that sometimes we can do stuff just because it's nice. So I'm going to play a little bit of an old song, uh, which fits. Round like a circle and a spiral, like a wheel within a wheel, never ending nor beginning, on an ever spinning reel. Like a snowball down a mountain Or a carnival balloon Like a carousel that's turning Running rings around the moon Like a clock whose hands are sweeping Past the minutes of its face And the world is like an apple Whirling silently in space Like the circles that you find In the windmills of your mind Round like a circle and a spiral, like a wheel within a wheel, never ending or beginning on an ever spinning reel. As the images unwind, like the circles that you find in the windmills of your mind. Thanks very much. Yeah. <laughs>